Hello again. Uh, as Jim told you, uh, we are unfortunately we had to change the, the program. So uh, what they're going to do today is just to give you some more details about uh, that you're going to have on Monday by Leonardo uh, about how to use this, this force field in, in Gromax. Okay. So you already know this. Go faster. Uh, the idea just is, is to, to, to give you a um, very short introduction. I'm the first one speaking on uh, in, in, during the course. Uh, for the next week, you are going to have a lot of this, uh, so I'm just going to the to the very very highlights uh, titles. Um, what I'm presenting to you here is something taken out of context, certainly. Uh, it's uh, the underlying physical laws necessary for a mathematical theory of a large part of physics and the whole. Uh, of chemistry and those comp are those completely known. And the difficulty is now only that the exact application of these laws uh, leads to the equations much too complicated to be soluble. It therefore becomes desirable that uh, approximate practical methods of applying quantum mechanics should be developed, which can lead to an explanation of the main features of complex atomic systems without too much computation. This is Paul Dirac, 19. Uh, to the uh, I'm saying this is out of context because uh, at this time you see there were no computers. So computations were just uh, writing down equations and solving that. Uh, still the idea it's, uh, applies and uh, what we are trying to do is just to try to uh, solve uh, or to, to develop some methods to make things easier to be able to calculate faster and just to extend the uh, time limit that the traditional power uh, imposed. In, in every uh, a time limit and also size limits, of course. So, uh, when you have to, when you start to think about coarse grain in something, uh, the idea is that you have to try to simplify uh, your system, okay? So, you're, you're starting to think that you have, you may want to remove some uh, unnecessary parts in the sense that uh, things that you think that may not be so important or may not be fundamental for, for the description of the process that you are uh, interested in. Uh, essentially, you are going from a, from a high detail representation to a low detail representation, and for doing that you have a, something like a, a, a transformation matrix, let's call it, uh, We take you from here to there. In the case of a proton, a very common uh, approach is to say, okay, I will keep only one atom per residue. Uh, Usually, this is the, the, the alpha carbon, but may also be the beta carbon or, or whatever. Uh, and a very, very common approximation is just to say, okay, I use a transformation matrix that takes me from here to there. Okay? So you, ha you end with the one bit per residue um, using this kind of transformation. Of course, here, um, and this is only because I'm biased, uh, the transformation matrix would say just keep the position of the C alphas and remove all the rest. Okay? Uh, but this is not necessarily the case. You may use, uh, and many people use, uh, matrix of charge. Uh, you just lump in a, le a lot of residues or entire proteins as uh, we were seeing in the lecture of uh, Max Bonomi uh, and, and, and so on. So the, uh, at this point, the choice of the system at the uh, low detail is very much up to you. Okay, so this is uh, a critical because you have to decide how to do it and you have to decide which, which is the minimum number of components you need to describe a system. And this is a crucial part. Okay, because uh, after the transformation matrix, uh, everything you do will be related with this. So you, if you are losing something here in this representation, then it is lost. Okay, you, you cannot. Uh, get back those those uh, details. For instance, rotations uh, in particular angles, they are just completely uh, whipped out. Right? Um, and this is something you have to, to consider because uh, suppose that you have a, a whatever, a generalized coordinate and the energy, uh, in a high detail system, let's assume that this is atomistic, uh, you will have a rad -like scape, landscape like this one. Uh, but and if you're lucky enough, if you coarse grain your system, you will end with something like this. Okay? So the first, the first uh, consequence of this is that usually we think in time as the period necessary for things to happen. 
Okay, so you, you realize immediately that for going from here to here you need some time because you have to cross this barrier, but in going from here to here the time will be much much shorter. Okay, so meaning that and well, needless to say if you if you have to cross all this, go right here to a global mean. Okay, so uh, immediately you realize that uh, doing this you are really changing things. So you are really losing information that you will not be able to recover. I told you the last time that we recovered atomistic information. Yes, and we are not the only ones, but we are kind of cheating, and I told you that too. So uh, you can recover, you can use tricks to recover atomistic information, but they are just tricks, right? So uh, never forget that you are moving in this space, and from points in this space, you reconstruct, and perhaps you go down here. Okay? This is something important to keep in mind. So, uh, from the good side, uh, you not only get a, a reduction uh, in the computational demands only because you are uh, reducing the number of atoms involved in the system, but you will also get an advantage because you will be able to sample much more conformations much faster. Right? But keep always in mind that the time is something very complicated. Uh, to assess in a coarse grain system. Um, when you do coarse grain, there are essentially two strategies. Oh, sorry. Uh, one is related to this called the bottom up strategy, uh, in which actually what you do is a systematic derivation of the parameters. Usually you have some reference which is normally an all atomistic simulation or even quantum mechanics simulation and from that you get the information that you need uh, to uh, develop interaction parameters in this kind of approaches. Uh, the other way is the other way to do it is uh, uh, which is called a top down uh, in which you have an idea of the model you want to, to, to reproduce and go and try to reproduce um, in a, a mostly heuristic way uh, experimental information available in the literature. Uh, I will not argue uh, against any of those. We are our approach is this one, but actually uh, both uh, both uh, kind of, of strategies has uh, uh, strengths and, and, and weakness, um, and it very much depends also on the the, the which in which you decide to course your system. Okay. Uh, just. A couple of very, very, very famous um, um, systems to, to, to derivate uh, information in a systematic way. One of the most famous is uh, the so-called Boltzmann inversion. And the idea, well, of course, it requires, as I told you, a reference system with a high detail. The idea is that you have any quantity in, a, in an ensemble with a, a Q degrees of freedom, then the, this, this quantity here will follow a Boltzmann distribution. Okay, and it is immediately realized that if you uh, if you uh, make an inversion here, you go to this, uh, and this is of course the, the the origin of the name. This is just a Boltzmann inversion, and what you end up is uh, with the potential of mean of mean field, which it can be calculated very easily from atomistic simulations. Okay, so if you have already all the, your trajectories, it's it is almost immediate to get a potential of mean field. Uh, and of course, you can you can do it uh, iteratively, and you can uh, refine uh, the initial guess just going with iterative steps. Uh, as I told you, I'm just going very fast, fast on this. Uh, of course, you always may have some problems. Uh, one of the problems is, is that the, essentially the properties of the logarithm, because if this is uh, this uh, in this way, then uh, the, the the transform expression will have a potential which is just additive. And this may not always be the case. Uh, and then also, something which is uh, important to keep in mind is that um, from the information you extract, you have to be sure that you have a complete sampling. Okay, so your atomistic simulation or your higher detail simulation has to be uh, and really has to have a, a complete sampling because otherwise you are just extrapolating uh, um, um, data. And for instance. Something which is very unfrequent, but we have seen a, a lot of uh, examples of uh, rare events, uh, is the exploration of cis peptides. Usually, an atomistic force field will not uh, explore a cis uh, peptide conformation, and meaning that you will not see uh, ever 
um, a cisperptide in um, in a coarse grain simulation extracted from this. Okay. The second one is what is called the force matching. Uh, already the name tells you everything. The idea is that you do a matching of the forces that you need in the coarse grain system using the forces that you have in the fine grain system. Okay. Uh, so again, since you have a high detail uh, trajectory, uh, you can just measure the forces and be sure that in your transformer or in your coarse grain system you can extract the forces. Uh, and of course, this needs some a very large amount of, of data, but uh, this is no longer true in the sense that uh, with the normal computers we can generate a lot of data. So this is no longer um, a limitation. The number of uh, of data that you need to extract uh, a reasonably uh, accurate force expression. Um, again, you will see a lot of this in the next week, so I will not waste time with you. Uh, on the other side, more on the on the heuristics, uh, I have, I, I mean, I, I can but mention uh, the, the one that is for sure known uh, by almost every one of you, uh, which is the Martini force field. They are very famous guys in in, uh, in Europe, um, and they have developed a, a very easy to use force field quite accurate. It is based essentially uh, in calculation of partition functions. Um, has some features about, uh, I mean, they, they have a very uh, nice uh, recipe for mapping things. They have a water molecule for solvation. It worked at, at the beginning uh, for membranes, but then they extended to, to proteins and also polysaccharides and so on. Uh, if you want to you're doing nasty things, Jim. <laughs> no, no, don't worry. Um, if you want to, uh, well, of course, you can download the force field from from the web page, and we uh, have a lot of, of uh, advantages. Um, I have seen already some posters uh, using Martini, so some of you are really uh, real experts in that. Uh, the representation is, uh, as, I, as I said, quite simple. You have just a, a few uh, particles which uh, uh, contain some um, tabulated interactions, um, and this is what rules essentially uh, the, the, um, the dynamics of the system. For uh, the bonding part, the, the, the parameters were derived by uh, force matching approach, and I think this is uh, for sure the most used uh, course going model for. Uh, for biological systems nowadays. Um, so let's go to our part. Um, the idea on this is that I would like to tell you what are you are going to do uh, on Monday uh, during the tutorial. Uh, so uh, perhaps I will repeat a couple of slides and uh, things we saw uh, the last time. Um, but I would like to tell you some, some details and please raise your hand and, and uh, stop me whenever you want. And we can so we can discuss uh, things. Uh, and there are some references for a couple of papers where the, the exercises were are uh, taken. Um, so I, I show you this already. Our first field so far is a model for DNA, water, ions, and proteins. Uh, we are not going to speak about proteins today. Just a few of words about uh, DNA and, and salvation and. These two papers are those that you are going to try to, I mean, you are going to do simulations from this one, uh, the one in which we presented the, the what for model, and the recent, the much more recent one in which we presented what for as a, a method for salvation uh, in a hybrid phase. So if, if you have time and you are boring during the weekend, just go and, and check out these papers, so you will be able to correct Leonardo uh, on Monday. Uh, so how does it work? Well, we use, just for simplicity, we decided to use exactly the same Hamiltonian that any molecular dynamic simulation. You may recognize the terms here. Uh, the, the question is, how do you derive uh, the, the parameters? Because I told you um, we are most on, on heuristics, so we try always to uh, reproduce some structural data. And in doing that, uh, Our strategy is usually to take the equilibrium positions from 
the distances between atoms. Remember I told you the last time that uh, what we do for mapping is to keep the positions of real atoms and use this to center our bits. Okay? So the positions are fixed, we don't have to, to fit that. Uh, we decided to have this kind of, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, force constant. Uh, also the same happens for, for um, uh, angles, uh, angle bending. Uh, those force constants you see that they are really small, but this is because of computational efficiency. Uh, remember that the, the frequency of, the, of an harmonic oscillation is related to the square root of k over k divided by, by m. So k is the force constant and m is the mass. Uh, so we decided to have very flexible force constants because of two reasons. First one is computational efficiency. This allows us to go uh, with time steps of uh, 20 femtoseconds. And the second one is that since the, mo the molecules are coarse grain, we also want to have some flexibility on that. So we really want them to, to be able to deform, uh, to adapt themselves one to each other. Uh, same for the dihedrals. Uh, they come from the structure. And something that we use very much as a free parameter is uh, this, are, are these components here. Um, because these are the ones that allows, allow us to keep uh, and to, to fit the structural properties in, and in particular in DNA. Yes? I have one question about the, uh, the partial charges. So, um, like, there's some kind of fermentation. Yes. So when you are coarse graining, can you still assume that that is a vacuum? We don't, we don't use a, a fixed, uh, I mean, we don't use um, a dielectric constant. Uh, you would see that the, the, the model, the water model, generates its own permittivity. Okay. Uh, we use partial charges, and in the very uh, original version of the DNA model, it was uh, using a uh, generalized model for implicit solvation, so the solvent was not there at all. Uh, it's just a, a, a way of uh, taking into account the solvation uh, with in, implicitly using a, a kind of screening uh, parameter, which depends on the on how much exposed is an atom to the to the to the environment. Uh, for partial charges, we use there are three parameters. Yes, but uh, we have some physical chemical constraints um, which are uh, mainly related to intuition. Meaning that, for instance, a nucleotide may, may have or must have a charge equal to one, and we also fix the recognition in the Watson Crick region in such a way that they they can be complementary. You will see in the next slide. Uh, Yes. Just a question about the sure. charges. So these are charges on these coarse grain of feet, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so are they really partial charges or are they like always like integers because this whole region? No, they are partial. How do you decide what they are? Uh, they are partial charges. That they are very much like normal atoms, in yeah, a way. Like, I mean, like different methods would give you different, like even if you were just doing atoms, like this method yes. would give you this number. What, what really happened in the case of DNA is that uh, we realized at the end that partial charges were not very much, very much important. Okay. It was important uh, to, to, to keep the, the, the complementarity, but uh, um, most of the, of the structural fitting was done using the, the torsional okay. diagrams. Okay. And this we used as a, as a real free parameter and uh, was fitted uh, against um, melting curve for, of, for DNA in the case of DNA, uh, and in, 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 in different cases we use this as a, pretty, uh, as a free parameter to fit to different problems. Uh, again, for, because of computational efficiency, we, all the masses uh, in, the, in the last version are set to 50 atomic units, uh, which, by the way, uh, if you distribute this in six bits, uh, will give you, um, with an approximation of one atomic unit, the, the, mass, the approximate mass of uh, any nucleotide. Um, is it different for 1,4? No, it's the same. Oh. So why it's different? always the same. The mass is always fixed to, to okay. 50. So the charges. This is again the same picture. Blur. To confuse you. Uh, I was saying that, for instance, we, we know that nucleotides uh, bear a negative charge. So in the phosphate groups here, we use a, a charge of minus 1. But also, we decided that each of the atoms in the Watson-Crick region 
must keep the physical chemical uh, ancestor at the atomistic level, uh, put in a partial charge, a negative partial charge on this oxygen and a positive partial charge and on this uh, NH2 uh, atom. And, and the same for all the rest. Meaning that, uh, as you immediately realize, uh, you have a, a good complementarity and this is what guides uh, the recognition in, in Watson Creek. Uh, if you put, for instance, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, well, if you put a G here, uh, it will cause a, a clash because they are too big and so it would, you, you will have a distortion. But if you put the C here, what you will have is a kind of what in, in RNA is called wobble. So they shift slightly in such a way that they, in the, if you put this here, uh, you will have only two uh, hydrogen bonds. Okay, so they, they really can recognize the, the electrostatics and they can really act in consequence. Um, well, this is what I was saying. Partial charges were set, were set at the end uh, to minus point, mi plus minus 0.2 and plus minus uh, 0.4, and this is because they have to sum up zero, right? Because this is minus one, and so this is uh, zero. And this has to be minus 0.4, and this is plus 0.2, and this is plus 0.2. Okay? And the same for all the others. Again, for uh, at the beginning we used a different uh, different value for that, but we realized that when we went to um, to compare this against the frequency of, of breaking and formation of, of Watson Creek interactions, uh, our initial model was too stiff. Okay, so really we had uh, um, two uh, two uh, two high electrostatic interactions in the in the border here between the two nucleotides, and we decreased that. To have the right uh, frequency of um, of um, opening and, form and breaking of uh, hydrogen bonds. Uh, if you take this and go to calculate the dipole moments of the nucleotides, then this is a comparison. I hope it is clear, not so much from here. Uh, the arrows are the dipole moments. Yellow is the coarse grain here. Uh, red is for charm 97, and blue is for prime 99, which are the most the, the perhaps the two best uh, models for, for DNA at the atomistic level. Uh, although you see that there are some differences in the modulus, uh, you will see that the, the, the vectors are pointing in the same direction. Um, so the electrostatic is uh, roughly well balanced between atomistics and, and coarse grain, and this is why we were, we were able uh, to construct a, a hybrid model uh, that I showed you the last time. Uh, and then uh, this goes with and without uh, solvation, so you can run the model with Bohr model. But we also uh, develop uh, our own water molecule, uh, which is again I, I told you uh, the last time it's just a, a kind of clusterization procedure. We we started from the clustering uh, of um, uh, of ordered water. Uh, took the, the distances from uh, um, experimental data and constructed the tetrahedron which has these characteristics. Uh, the, um, the bond length here is fixed by this geometry. Uh, you see that, again, the, the, the force constants for this, uh, for this bond are very small. This is actually uh, the, uh, an, an estimate of the energy um, uh, involved in a, a normal hydrogen bond formation, and this is because these two are bound more or less by a uh, hydrogen bond. Okay, so they really have to be able to oscillate a lot and, and move and distort this cluster. Uh, charge, the charge here is point, uh, zero, uh, zero point forty one. Uh, to fit the charges, actually, because we were thinking in uh, in the next level of uh, of development, uh, we decided not to to read really and go through a, a fitting parameter, uh, a fitting procedure, but we just tried. The, ch the partial charges present uh, in the atomistic models, the most famous one, uh, SPC, TF3P, and SPC slash E. So th those which three uh, point charges, right? And why do we have this this charge uh, configuration? Well, because if you consider that, for instance, this uh, this water here is making a hydrogen bond, is taking some of the negative charge of this water molecule because it's bound is bound to the lone pairs here in this oxygen. So this out of the cluster will have a partially positive character. You got it? No. You look confused? 
So, uh, suppose and this is a water molecule. Uh, actually, a water molecule is a kind of tetrahedron because you have two protons here and two lone pairs here and there. Okay, let me, let me do a drawing. So, this actually is something like this. Okay? Okay, so if this is doing a hydrogen bond with this, then all these parts is partially positive. Okay? Because some of the negative charge here is bound with that. Right? And so this gets a positive charge. And the same for the others. I mean, if they are contributed with a proton to, to, to make this, uh, uh, this hydrogen bond here, then they will be negative, are those the, the red ones. OK? And this comes also with a, with a version for solvated ions. This is the ion, and we use always a, a shell of six water molecules as a first solvation shell, which gives you a bulky ion, uh, which charges unitary in maybe plus or minus one, and which mass is that of the ion we want to represent plus uh, the mass of six water molecules traveling implicitly with that. Okay? Uh, and with that, I think we, we are set and we can go to the examples. Just uh, before going to that, uh, just a word of caution. Uh, first, uh, there's something important to notice, is, and it's the fact that even atomistic water models are not able to capture all the, the, the features of, of water. Water is a, a chemically a very simple object, but uh, the physical chemical properties of water are really, really very complicated. Okay? Even very high detail quantum calculations are not able to uh, to, to reproduce all the properties. Yes? So each of the four units in the watt board has 15 atomic units? Yes. Um, so it's not exactly representing five water molecules? No. It's each of these is representing uh, 11. Okay. Uh, let, me, let me explain you why. Let's assume that this is uh, not in, 4, in 3D because uh, I'm not good on, on 3D, but just in, in 2D. Okay, the thing that in each of these crossing points and in the middle of those, you have a water, right? In reality, you pick another car. This is the atomistic case. So you have one here, here, here. So if you if you take it in the vacuum. This is what for? If you do it in the vacuum, it will, yes, represent four molecules. Because this, in the middle, is implicit. But now, if you put this in the context of the liquid, the next work for model will be here. OK? It will not be this one for instance, because this place is already occupied. Okay? So the next one is here, and so on. So now, means that this central molecule in the arrangement contains, yes, three points, plus one which are in the neighborhood. Okay? Uh, and this is why you have more, uh, more waters. Uh, actually, if you count, you have five, but then the tetrahedron has only four faces, so it should be nine, right? But actually, what happens is that you don't have a perfect arrangement, so this is not a crystal. So you have some molecular interstices uh, in between. 
So the effective number that comes out is, is uh, actually is 10.21. We say 11, more or less. Just to have a, an integral number. It's okay? Okay. Uh, I was saying that even uh, even atomistic models have problems to reproduce um, to reproduce water properties. Uh, these here are some very typical water models uh, used at the coarse grain level. Uh, these ones here are th those that use uh, Martini in the in the very um, uh, um, first version. It's a four to one uh, mapping, so it implicitly um, includes four water molecules inside. Uh, since you have a cluster of water molecules, you are not supposed to have uh, a partial charge. So this is just a Van der Waals a Van der Waals liquid, uh, which moves. This is the, the, the original uh, version. Okay, the one without. Uh... Without any anything but uh, Van der Waals. Okay. Uh, this is the the, the, the newest one. Uh, this is called Mercedes-Benz uh, model. It's a very old one. Uh, this is kind of a, a shell model with a dipole inside. I don't remember the number. The, in the yes, then the name. Uh, this, but it, I think it's also four uh, four uh, waters in in one. This is an improvement. You have it's, a, it's also a shell model. Uh, you have two particles inside, uh, one positive and one negative, and since they can move freely, they can represent pretty much, pretty much better in some water properties. Uh, this is a very new uh, model also um, by the group of uh, Van Gunsteren. Uh, it has a dipole which represents at the end five water molecules. And this is called, since this is a Mercedes-Benz, this is the, the BMW. Um, it's B is big uh, multiple uh, water. That's why it's BMW, <laughs> uh, which contains not only uh, an, a dipole but also a quadrupole moment because you, you have more than two particles, and also the the, the, the kind of interaction is not a simple uh, Van der Waals. It's a bit more complicated, so that's why I'm trying to represent this with the blurred uh, surface because it, this is really it's a, it's a kind of soft. Uh, interaction and this is ours. Uh, as you see, if you just compare it against simple water properties, very very frequent ones that you are interested in. Uh, for instance, surf surface tension, we are really bad. Okay, so this is experiment. This is not this is SPC, so uh, and, and T3P, the famous uh, water models. Uh, we are really good in density, but this is was fitted uh, uh, by by construction. So this is I, I'm not particularly proud of that because it's, uh, I, I wrote the numbers to do that. Uh, we are really good on centrifugal coefficient, and this is uh, an emerging property of the model. Um, and then, well, then dielectric uh, permittivity and so on. Some of them are good. In some of the cases, actually, these are uh, used also with an implicit dielectric in all the space. Uh, we also are a bit uh, overestimating that. But the point is that you see that you have a large, large variations, even if you consider these ones which are atomistic. So uh, you cannot expect too much from water models in a sense that if you consider at the coarse grain level, you will certainly have to pick which is the one that better fits to your problem. So if you are interested in reproducing uh, something with electrostatics, perhaps ours is not so bad. Uh, Aggregation processes of something which is related with surface tension is not, for sure, a good option, uh, and so on. So you really have to, uh, really have to be aware that uh, all these models have some, some may have in potential uh, some, some, uh, some difficulties, and you have to be sure what we are you are trying to do. An important point also is that in the, very much in the same way that you cannot mix. Uh, atomistic models with any kind of force field. So if you use, for instance, CHARM, which was developed to, to work with T3P, you should not use SPC with CHARM. Okay? So pretty much the same with this. Uh, the guys who are developing these models are trying to do a hard work uh, in trying to fit properties. So you, it's not, never a good idea to mix uh, uh, apples with uh, bananas. Okay? So, if we, so there's also a new water model that's the tip 4B. 
So I'm not like 100% sure about his its uh, efficiency, but how like does it? How where does it uh, fit in this particular picture? Uh, I don't. Excuse me. I, I didn't got it. a new model. Yeah, for, for T3P? Tip 4P, not T3P. Yes, it's not so new, it's very old, and there is also a T5P. Okay. Uh, and they have a, an increasing level of complexity in the sense that they are considering uh, uh, four or five uh, points uh, within a water model. Uh, yes, the problem with, with those models is that uh, since you have a lot of water, nearly 80% in, in each of your simulation box, mm -hmm. uh, then you really go trying to reduce the number of waters uh, because it, it's eating most of the computer time, uh, you are usually not so much interested in, in the water properties in the bulk because you are interested in your protein, not in water. And so yes, there are some more uh, more elaborated models, not only this thing of the series of, of the tip, uh, but they are computationally more expensive. And in, in, in any case, uh, there, are, there is no single water model, no single water model that can be regarded as the best ever. Uh, this story is always the same. I mean, you really have to go to and see the properties and uh, check also for the compatibility with with the force field areas. It's something very important, and it's something that usually when one starts, just set up the simulation and run, and really has to be considered that the the, the parameters are tuned to reproduce um, different properties and also to interact in a proper way with the solutes, which may not be the same. Um, Okay, so I will show you again this this picture. Uh, when you put the water DNA ions, you know already what happens. So we go fast. Ah, right. Things start to move. You have localization of ions uh, and so on. Just to remind you how it how it goes and. This is the simulation you are going to do um, on Monday, okay? That's why I was showing it to you. Um, if you rotate and remove the ions, it's perhaps you may not see it so clearly, but never mind. You see, that the, uh, remember there was a localization of, of sodium within the, the minor group and so on. We will see some more details. Uh, but. This is really what happens. I mean, this is just a, a, a snapshot with the, all the water molecules that are within uh, five angstroms, I think. Uh, you see that you have a, a white solvation in the major group, some water molecules uh, very precisely located in the minor group, and, and all around. And if you try to calculate the root mean square deviation, then sorry, the, the, the rate distribution function, you will see that, for instance, the first, the first distribution here corresponds to the positive bits of water, which is correct. Oh, sorry, this is the the red distribution function around the phosphate atom, the, the phosphate bit. Okay. So the first thing you see is the positive bits of water, which is more or less like this. So these are the phosphates, and these are the positive bits. Uh, they are topologically bound, so they cannot ex uh, escape from the from the DNA. But this is the negative uh, part of what for, which is always pointing outside, like in this case. And then you have the ions. These are the counter ions. This is sodium, and this is potassium, which is bulkier and it stays. Although it is attracted, it cannot go so easily within the minor group. And this is chlorine, which starts only at after uh, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 uh, nanometers from the phosphate. So they really. Uh, feel the, the, the electrostatics, they really feel the repulsion, and as in this case, there is an attraction in, uh, for positive bits and, uh, and a kind of repulsion for negative bits. Okay? Uh, as I told you, ions and uh, water localized within the, the, the minor group following this kind of arrangement, which was reported first by the group of Lauren Williams. Uh, what we see is that the ions and the water molecules uh, go to, to fill these places here in a zigzag arrangement. If you see the, 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 the dimensions of these arrangements, um, in brackets is our, uh, our uh, simulation. 
and no brackets is uh, the experimental measure by X-ray. This is in a, on a very high resolution structure, and you see that our position is not so bad compared with the experiment. Uh, and when this happened, I told you the um, the distance between phosphates goes down, and it fits the X-ray data only when you have from four to six atoms. Uh, just wanted to show you what happens in, in time, because the previous one was just an average on, on, on the time. Uh, what happens is that this is the narrowing, so the, 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 um, the conformation of the DNA, which is more similar to the before. And if you let the simulation run, what you see is that at the beginning you have one or two uh, entries of ions within the minor group. Um, they enter and go out, enter and go out. Uh, in red here you have the total number, in green is the number of sodiums, and in blue is the number of potassiums within the minor group. You see that there is a clear preference for, preference for, for sodium, and at a certain point it happens that a large number of ions go into the minor group. This is perfectly, uh, perfectly correlated with uh, the narrowing in the, in the minor group. Then they just, because of thermal fluctuations, uh, decide to go away. And this brings back, back DNA uh, close to the B form, uh, and so on. Uh, the interesting thing is that nanosecond long binding events have been reported by uh, atomistic simulations. The longest simulation I know on, on this kind of system is this one by Perez, Luque, and Orozco. These are the ones that the guys that. Um, actually develop the force field for, uh, for DNA. Uh, the trajectory is available on the web, uh, so you can download it and, and, and measure these kind of things, which is, was uh, very nice for us. And as I told you, these kind of uh, short-lived uh, binding events are present in atomistic simulations. Well, those were certainly not. Um, since we were fit into the, into the X-ray structure, we were, we were uh, more or less happy. Uh, and this kind of gives, gives the idea that the ions mediate a conformation of DNA. It's uh, uh, non-stable on time, so it can fluctuate with the, with the temperature. And it kind of bends and unbends the DNA during the dynamics. Okay? And if you go, this is 4 microseconds. If you go to nearly 10 times that, this was what we were seeing. The only thing that you see is that the pattern just repeats. Okay? So this suggests, perhaps, that the only reason why atomistic simulations are not seeing this is because of simply a limited sampling. Okay? Uh, which is uh, very important because, uh, well, to have a proper sampling is crucial, not only as I said at the beginning, in the, in the development of the parameters, but only in the interpretation of the data. Okay? Because if you don't have the proper sampling, you will see something that may look interesting for you, but then if you go closer, uh, you get with the idea that you really were completely wrong. Okay? So, proper sampling is crucial. Um, okay. So, uh, this was the, 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 the simulation I showed you before, it's the one that you're going to reproduce, hopefully on Monday. Uh, and then we went to, we came with the idea, okay, it's, we see this, this kind of, of bending uh, and so on. Is there any biology related with that? Because at the end, if, if it is DNA, and, in, and it is kind of saying that uh, DNA was evolved uh, to be in a medium with uh, sodium and potassium and not with any other, uh, any other uh, um, ion. I mean, barium will not do that, uh, or ruthenium, or, or whatever. Um, and yes, we found that uh, there is, uh, in fact, a very important case of uh, protein DNA recognition, which is uh, related with uh, uh, with um, things that are apparently not involved in the direct recognition. This is called indirect readout, and this refers to things that proteins read in the DNA but not in the contact parts, okay? Uh, I want to show you a few slides about this. Uh, this is the E2 transactivator protein of the human papillomavirus. Uh, this is a dimeric protein. 
Um, and it's very much interesting that this is the sequence that you are seeing in this DNA. Uh, these are the contact points, so the, the non bold uh, nucleotides here corresponds to this part here. Uh, if you introduce a, a double mutation here, AT by CG, you get a drop in uh, three fold times in the binding affinity of the protein. Okay? So this will not recognize this DNA as this DNA, despite the fact that these two mutations are in this part here, which are not in contact with the protein. And in fact, uh, if you go to see the crystal structure, you will see that there is a lot of water in the, in the crystal. Okay? So, uh, we ended with the idea that if uh, this really was the case, then we should find perhaps something like this. And what we did was to perform the simulations of DNA, not protein, only DNA, uh, in aqua solvent at the physiological concentration of ions. First with this, uh, let's call it high affinity target. And what happens is that you run the simulations. This is the time in, in microseconds, there are 20 microseconds. You have these uh, small binding events that we saw in, in the previous simulation, usually one or no ions within this region here. These are the density maps around. Uh, at a certain point you have two, and at a certain point you really start to have uh, a lot of ions in that, uh, up to eight. And this is correlated again with a marked decrease in the narrowing of the minor group. You may imagine that if you decrease the narrowing in the minor group, then it generates a bending. Okay, so if you go to compare now, again, we never use the protein in this simulation. The only thing that we did was to fit the protein, the, the DNA that we used during the simulation against this one uh, in, the, in the crystal structure. Okay, we measure, for instance, two contact points there, and this is what happens. Once the ions go in, the contact points, the distance between the crystal structure and our DNA, go down by four Armstrongs or so. If you do the same with the low affinity target, the pattern now, now is much more fluctuating. Measure the same contact point. Never use the protein, just the DNA. You get the same pattern. This is the experimental one. You never go close to that, so you're always like five Armstrongs to that. And if you calculate the root mean square deviation in the low affinity target and high affinity target, this is what you get from uh, in taking as a reference the, the X-ray structure. So you go almost at 1.5 uh, Armstrong's in difference, uh, which is related always with, uh, with the case of the, the entry of the ions. So it gives you the, the, the idea that the, 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 um, the internal readout process may be related with this. We are actually now going through a much longer number of, of, uh, of mutants within the, the, this hinge part uh, and trying to, 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 um, to find a way to correlate the energy or the binding energy with the, the distortions that we see. But the, the, the idea that the, this, um, this kind of simulation put out is that DNA really can explore some states which are uh, milliseconds long or something like that, which is um, enough time to for the protein to, to recognize, uh, decreasing very much the barriers for protein DNA formation, okay? Because uh, the, the protein really don't, doesn't have to bend the DNA, it just has to uh, find it as a, pretty much as, as a rigid uh, bar. Okay? I'm going with time. How, how long are uh, simulations like this? These are 20 pentos, uh, <laughs> no, 20 no, microseconds. Uh, ah, how much in in the computer? Yeah. Uh, we have very uh, slow computers in a in a dual in a, yeah in a dual quad core. Uh, you run this in like uh, one microsecond per day or so. So it's uh, uh, it's at the beginning. It's uh, like um, for explicit solvent, it goes like uh, eight hundred times faster than atomistics. Remember also when you do a coarse grain, uh, the first big number that you get in, in, in speed up is because of the time step. So we, we, we gain one order of magnitudes already just moving the time step from two femtoseconds to 20 femtoseconds. And all the rest comes from the reduction in the number of, of uh, components of the system. 
the display, so like with increasing the time step ruin the stability of the simulation, maybe you could do like 200? Um, well, no, there are some issues related with the energy conservation and um, also it's very much under discussion, I mean, and, all, and what happens with the structure of the solvation if you uh, go uh, yeah. to, to, to much bigger time steps. Uh, this kind of, uh, of um, 20 femtosecond time steps is related also with the, with the uh, size of the coarse grain we have. Uh, so with the dimensions, uh, if you want to increase the, the, um, the time steps, perhaps you should go to a, a more aggressive coarse grain, a uh, coarse grain in like, I don't know, 10 base pairs all in one bead or something like that. So if you increase very much, the, then also you, you have uh, instability, numerical instability in, in the solution, the propagation of the, of the Newton equations. Um, but yes, the, the, the story of the, of the time step, always, obviously you want to go as, as, as big as possible. But then you have to check the, 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 that your energy is going, uh, I mean, the current green is producing a lot of energy and it's um, like So there are, there are many issues with, with, uh, with time step. We can go a little bit farther, but not, not that much. At a certain point, the simulation will, will just break. Okay, um, in the last five minutes or so, I tell you, uh, if, if we have time, uh, Monday you will also try to do a simulation with, uh, with hybrid water. Uh, the idea is that since the, 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 the what for model was generated as a, as a basic structure of a, of a cluster of water, then it should be possible uh, to mix it with water molecules, and water molecules will not realize uh, that they are dealing with something which is not water and vice versa. Uh, so uh, if a water molecule interacts with an elementary cluster of waters, it may be that they don't have to, 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 to complain that much. Uh, and you should be able to do a kind of hybrid simulation in which uh, you may have a part of the system at the atomistic level and part of the system at the coarse level. And this is interesting because, as I said, um, in a simulation box, usually 80% of the atoms are water, okay? So if you reduce significantly the, the number of water molecules, then you can gain uh, a bit. No, no, it, it is not huge, but you can gain a factor of two or three uh, doing this kind of, of approaches, okay? Of course, it depends also very much on, on the, on the um, how much solvation do you have. I mean, in where your system is a membrane system or a globular or, or whatever, you have more or less water for the solids. Um, so for this to work, what you need is that the delta G of solvation has to be negative in all the cases. So, if, of course, to put SPC in SPC has to be negative, but if you want to put SPC in what for, it also has to be negative. So, they really have to be able to mix. So, the thermodynamics m must allow this. Uh, same for what for in SPC as a solvent, and of course, what for in what for. So, what you see here is that, yes, when you put the hybrid, so when you consider to, to, to solvate SPC with what for you gain energy, but not as much energy as you gain in uh, putting a water in the solvent in the in the in the water solution. Okay, meaning that uh, yes, they will mix as they do here, but they will lack like more to be in a separate phase. So what you will have is a is a partial mix. Okay, so this is what happened here. You have water here around, and you have some what for here and there within the within the. Um, the, um, the atomistic phase. Uh, in this case, it's a, it's a bit a mess because we started for a completely uh, distorted, I mean, completely mixed conformation. But if you do it in a, in a, a bit smarter way, uh, so you put two slabs of water, one aside the other, then you are able also to characterize how big is the interface between uh, atomistic and coarse grain water. And you see this is the density. You have a kind of uh, two nanometer interface where they mix. See, so there is a slight peak. This is uh, in blue. We have the total uh, density, which is the sum of atomistics plus coarse grain. We have a small peak here, uh, and this is because at the interface, some uh, uh, red one, some of the water molecules. Suppose this is this is the interface. Uh, 
not four, you know, unless you have atomistics. Then some of the waters here may decide to occupy this place. Okay? Or this place. Okay, so in this region here you have a water which is implicitly considered by the Watford solvent plus a water which is not implicitly considered, so it's a real uh, atomistic water. And this is what generates this peak. For all the rest, you only have higher fluctuations because of the higher granularity of Watford and it works reasonably well. Things get a little more complicated if you decide to put ions um, because uh, coarse green uh, ions like very much atomistic water. So when we started to mix ions with water, uh, and all the coarse green uh, ions decided to, to go on into the atomistic phase. So we used the trick, which was uh, to set a, a differential interaction. Uh, this is the coarse green ion, and this is a what for a bit, so they can get in touch. But every time a coarse green ion sees an SPC water, we put it at the at the distance, so we, we kind of uh, include a new uh, solvation shell on that. So we put it a, a bit more separated from the ion. In such a way that the electrostatic uh, gain in uh, interact with the, with the atomistic water is reduced by the presence of this implicit water. Okay? If you do that, you see this is a, this is a, uh, I'm going to show you the picture in, in a moment, but this is a slab of water. Um, just for clarity, I'm not showing uh, all the what for, just the, the green dots that you can see there. Uh, the the um, yellow and orange ions are coarse grain, and blue and cyan ions are atomistics. Okay, so you have this is atomistic here. Uh, you see this is after equilibration. I don't know if you can see it, but this ion is coordinated by some of the waters here and by coarse grain over there. Okay, so if you run the simulation, no, too fast. You see that all the coarse grain ions go out now from the atomistic side, and the atomistic uh, ion went up to find the the, the atomistic uh, region. It's, now it's explained again. And something which is also interesting. Oh no, too too late. Let's go and see it again. Okay, is that always the ion you can see here? It's, this is a, a good point. This is very good, uh, it's nicely coordinated by four waters. There must be another one over there. So when the ions travel along the the, the coarse grain medium, they travel with their own uh, solvation shell. Okay, pretty much as they do because they have an implicit solvation shell. If you do the same, whoop, if you do the same trick, you put the ions. Now the colors are not the same here and here. I'm sorry, uh, because I took this directly from the from the paper. Um, if you go to measure the densities, you will see that the, well, all the properties are not affected. Uh, these are the ions uh, at the atomistic uh, in the atomistic uh, side, and these are the ions in the in the coarse grain side. If you measure, for instance, different properties as the coordination number uh, of water around ions, you see it's pretty much the same for sodium in the hybrid and fine grain and uh, chlorine. And you cannot see any difference, or, or well, yeah, you can see some here. Uh, this is the, the ion, ion number density, and are, they are pretty much the same uh, for hybrid and, and fine grain. And well, you cannot see many, many difference. Perhaps here it's a little bit darker. But they are. This is because they are perfectly superimposed. Um, okay, I will not through this. Uh, just finally, just wanted to tell you that you will see in, in that paper as you. This quite blur. Um, we use this as a, as a non-trivial uh, test case to solve it, um, a fusion a membrane fusion complex. This what you see here is the protein, and these are the membranes. This is a protein which is supposed to pull uh, the two membranes together and generate fusion. 
uh, we never we never saw that because we were we were not interested in that, but we just did it in, in collaboration with uh, with uh, Mark Baden at uh, at uh, Paris. And they had a fully atomistic system of this, and so we compared uh, the fully atomistic simulation with the hybrid simulation. Uh, you can see the details in the paper. All the the coarse grain uh, part here is in blue, and the red part here is atomistic. This is the membrane. Um, the reduction here is more or less half, um, half of the system, so you get more or less uh, a two-fold speed up for this kind of systems. Actually, this is this was kind of not a very smart uh, choice because uh, if since you have a, 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 wide, a very long surface on the membrane, then you will need also a large number of atomistic water to solvate the membrane. So if you go to uh, to globular systems, when you have you are close to a sphere then you will need less water to solvate that and the, the gain in using these kind of approaches will be a much, could arrive up to threefold or so. Yes, and that's, that's my last one. So is part of like what you were showing just before shows that your coarse grain and all atom water stay separate and that's good because when you come into this you don't want water is interacting directly. Yes, I mean, um, what you are going to do is just a part of the ions during the, 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 the tutorial because it's just easy to do. Simulations are, are very fast and so on. This is will take a quite, quite more uh, because um, this uh, 30k atoms in, in the atomistic system. Um, but yes, in principle, the idea is that the, the atomistic parts of the system will always remain solvated with, with this kind of water. And... And what for behaves like uh, bulk water, in a sense. Yes, excuse me. Um, about, about the same the same point of the hybrid water, it seems to me like it, it might be also problematic if uh, it kind of forces the phase separation, which might also affect the results. So would it, if you want just to have like physical regions of the simulation which are cross-grained and atomistic, wouldn't you like maybe to do something like if a coarse-grained atom moves to another geographical region where it then transform it into... Yes, this is called address uh, adaptive resolution. So and in, in, the, in that scheme uh, you have Kind of, you have to define two at, at least two parts of the system, maybe much more, but in principle at least two. And when a particle goes uh, flying around in a certain region, it will be say coarse grain. But then, if it goes into the hot spot, it will be fine grain. Uh, so they, they change on the fly, and they change the topology, uh, and so on. Uh, and these are uh, this, perhaps this is a very very nice approach and. I have to say that yet this is not so fast. I mean, it's still, uh, people have to solve some problems with the, with the implementation uh, because really you have to keep track of all the dynamics of the system and decide whether they have to, to convert from coarse grain to fine grain or not, it's and vice versa. Yeah. Yes, and you have to be able to map back, to back map too, and this is an important point too. Uh, so uh, it is uh, that there are many papers on that. Uh, and many in which the, uh, water, a coarse grain water molecule is uh, one sphere, but it has the same size of a water. So at the end, the only thing that you recover is, are, is the position of the protons, which in any case are bound to this oxygen. Uh, there are uh, um, other models too, but uh, the, the simplest way the, the simplest way to do is, is that. Uh, I think it's in the future we're going to see much more on, the, on that. Um, in this case, the idea is that you don't have to change the resolution because uh, since the delta G's, I mean, the, the thermodynamics rules the mixing, so you don't have to touch it. Yeah, it, it, they, they know what, where to go. If you get artifacts out of the fact that you you form, you have phase separation, so you have two moieties that so like doesn't it make the entire system different, like less relevant because mm. I don't know, like, like don't think about it as coarse grain and full atom, but just like two molecules that not want to interact with each other. Yes, 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 yes. Is it the same system? Yes, yes, sure. Okay.
So you're having asking questions, I will just let you go for a coffee if you don't have any any other question. Okay, thank you.